Welcome to our Easter service here at Trinity Northside. I pray this finds you well wherever you are today. As we get started, I want to point out this candle here to my left. This is called a Paschal candle, and it's one of the central symbols in the Christian church of Easter. This candle is lit every year at the Easter vigil, which begins in the dark of night. And it reminds us in that darkness, the light of Christ shines. And this light is not overcome by the darkness, but instead it is a light that drives all the darkness away. It is a powerful, wonderful reminder for us this Easter Sunday. And one of the things I love about the Paschal candle is every Easter, it's a new candle. And at the vigil, we bless this candle. It may be hard to see over the screen, but it even has this year on it. It says 2020. And one of the things that I love is that whatever the year may hold, whatever uncertainty, whatever surprises each year brings, and this year has for so many been a remarkable, uncertain, unnerving year, and we still don't even know what the months to come will bring. And yet what we do know, without a shadow of a doubt, is that the light of Christ shines and will continue to shine. And at the vigil, one of the prayers you pray when you bless this candle is this prayer. And I thought it'd be a beautiful way to tie that service into our celebration today. The church prays, Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, all time belongs to him and all ages. To him be glory and power through every age and forever. Amen. 
That is our hope this Easter, that Christ is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and end, and he is Lord in every time and every age, including this year, 2020, including this very moment. And so as a way to join with us in worship, to join into this hope of Easter, the light of Christ, I'd encourage you, take a moment as we start and light a candle in your home to remind you in your own space, wherever you may be, that Christ, his light shines into your family, into your home as well, this very moment. So as we begin, we with joy and hope say together, Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, Alleluia. As we continue, we join our hearts in prayer and we say, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue in worship now as we sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. 
meets our eyes. Savior, teach us so to Psalm 118, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is gracious. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now confess that he is gracious, that his mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. The voice of joy and deliverance is in the dwellings of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord brings mighty things to pass. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord brings mighty things to pass. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord chastened me and corrected me, but he has not given me over to death. Open unto me the gates of righteousness, that I might go into them and give thanks unto the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter into it. I will thank you, for you have heard me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders refused has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You are the word of the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name. Beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 1 through 6. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who have survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there shall be a day when sentinels will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from Acts 10, 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear now the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. 
And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord Jesus, we do praise you. We praise you this Easter Sunday for your victory over sin and death and the way in which you restore us to perfect relationship with God. The way in which you invite us into healed, intimate union with the Father. We thank you for John's gospel, the unique way in which it speaks to us this day. Give us ears to hear, we pray, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, many of you will know this. On Sundays, we follow something called the lectionary, which is a three-year cycle of readings where we read the Bible as a community with other Christians around the world. And I love that each year, because it's a cycle, we are in a different gospel and we hear a different angle on the same story of our Lord's resurrection. And as I've thought about it this week, I think it's no coincidence that we're in John's gospel this year. I think our Lord is speaking to us in a beautiful way through this unique telling because John has a different approach than the other gospel writers. In many ways, the other gospel writers have this transcendent, magnificent vision of the resurrection, which is true and glorious and should be celebrated. But John's is far more intimate and personal. It's about restored relationships. And as we likely are in intimate and personal spaces, as you receive these words, as I preach them to my phone in an empty chapel, these are unique times, and yet I wonder, is God speaking to us in a beautiful way through John's gospel? I was thinking about this and came across one of my favorite books on my shelf about John's gospel called The Light Has Come by Leslie Newbegin. And I just turned earlier this week to his reflections on the gospel of John and this particular part we've read, and I was so blessed by it. And so I just want to read this to you as a reflection, just the opening paragraph of what he has to say. He said, St. John's account of what happened on the third day after the death of Jesus has a markedly different atmosphere from those of the first three evangelists. Whereas they speak of dazzling apparitions of an earthquake and of fear and amazement among the witnesses, John's account is calm and unspectacular. The emphasis is upon the restoration of the personal relationship broken by the events of Friday upon the way in which Mary of Magdala, the disciples, and Thomas are brought into a new and deeply intimate relationship with Jesus. Because John sees the lifting up of Jesus on the cross as the supreme manifestation of the divine glory, he sees the resurrection not as the reversal of the passion, not as the bringing of glory out of defeat, but rather as the enabling of the disciples to believe and so to be brought into a relationship with him whom death cannot destroy. In other words, to have life in his name. The promises of John chapter 14 are here fulfilled. I will not leave you desolate. I will come to you. Isn't that beautiful? I love that so much because it rings true in a profound way for me today. In years past, I've spent Easter Sunday in glorious cathedrals with choirs singing angelic hymns. I've spent it in big contemporary churches with lights and the band and joy and a sense of triumph and really everything in between. And yet this year, as I've said, I'm talking to my phone and likely you're sitting at home either alone or with your closest family and friends in what is undoubtedly the most unique Easter you and I have ever lived through. And yet maybe we need to hear these words from John today, that beautiful reminder in this place of isolation, sheltering in place, quarantined across our city, Jesus says, I will not leave you desolate, but I will come to you. Maybe that is the very Easter hope that you and I need to hear this year. And so what I wanna do is in our reading, just reflect on that relational angle. John gives us three people today that are named by name. There could have been others there, maybe other women with Mary, but only three are named. And so I just want to reflect on Mary and John and Peter and really their response to the resurrection as we see it today. 
Mary Magdalene is named first, but I want to finish with her, and so come, we'll come back to her at the end. And so we'll start with John and with Peter. John, the author of this account, I love John. I love the way in which he often calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. I also love that in his telling of this account, he slips in the fact that he's faster than Peter that he beat Peter in a foot race to the tomb. After Mary saw the empty tomb and went and got them and said, come and see, they race and John beats him there. But even though John is maybe the quickest on his feet, John is slow and methodical and calculated once he gets to the tomb. Verse four says, the two were running together and the other disciple, which is John, outran Peter and reached the tomb. But then when he gets there, He bends down and looks in and saw the linen wrappings. But verse 5 says he did not go in. I think John likes to take things at a distance. He's been been called the theologian, St. John the theologian. And for good reason. He likes to reflect and calculate. And if I'm honest, I love John for this reason. I can so deeply relate to John because this is me. This is how I go through life. I go through life at arm's length because I want to make sure whatever decision I make is calculated. And if it's not, it might be a decision I regret. I might come to regret having made a rash decision. And so I want to take my time with it. And yet how many times, countless times in my own story, as I've stood at arm's length thinking and reflecting, analyzing the details of the situation, the the moment has passed. Life itself has come and gone while I've stood back watching. In so many ways, Peter, Peter's the exact opposite of this. Peter doesn't think twice about anything. That's true to his character throughout the whole of the Gospels. And so Peter, you can just imagine the scene. He's maybe a bit slower, shows up kind of huffing, trying to catch his breath, but he he pushes John to the side. John, who's standing at the door, not going in, he kind of brushes him off, rushes in, doesn't think twice, sees the empty tomb, and then only after Peter goes in does John then follow. Verse 6 tells us that that following him, John then went into the tomb. And so very different approaches, very different temperaments and personalities, and yet they eventually find themselves at the same place. They enter the tomb, they believe, but they don't fully understand. They don't understand the full extent of what this could possibly mean. And so they leave pondering, leave contemplating what is the significance of this. And so they see it, they leave, and they go home. They go home to try and figure it out on their own, we could say. Yet only Mary, we're told by name, only Mary enters the tomb and stays. She lingers. She doesn't fully understand. Jesus is quite literally staring her face to face and she thinks he's the gardener. And yet she lingers and she stays. And I wonder then, is there something for us in this? Is this the perspective we need to have this Easter? Can we, like Mary, stay at the tomb of Jesus in our confusion, weeping, waiting and trusting that he will reveal himself to us, but we're not going to leave that place until he does? That's the beauty of Mary's witness. In verse 1 of our reading, It said, early on, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. And then it was that she saw that the stone had been removed. In all the other gospel accounts, the women come to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with burial spices, to prepare his body for burial. That's not the case in John's gospel. Presumably, this has already happened. And so why in the world then is Mary back at the tomb? And I think the only explanation is her love for Jesus. Her weeping and her grief drives her to be as near to him as she possibly can. And so going to the tomb is the closest she knows how to be to Jesus. And so she arrives and there finds the tomb empty, goes and gets the other disciples, brings them back, and they rush in, they rush out and go home and try and make sense of it on their own. But Mary stays. She stays at the tomb, weeping, longing, hoping, that there's something here to, to give her hope, to give her a reason for joy and celebration, but she doesn't see it. She doesn't know how it could possibly be. And I wonder, is there something for us in that today? Can we linger with Mary? 
long enough to see Jesus. Because maybe if you're honest, this is the way you approach Easter Sunday today. If you're honest, maybe you even feel shameful or discouraged that this is true, but we need to be true. Maybe you enter this Easter Sunday with tears in your eyes, weeping because of the moment we find ourselves in, either your own personal grief or just the collective weight of this moment that we find globally, aware of the countless millions who've been affected by this pandemic and just the weight of the world that so many are bearing. And we each bear that in a different way and in our own way. And so it means you may not come into this feeling triumphant. You may not be ready to sing the Easter alleluias. And maybe God in his mercy, our Lord in his kindness, gives us Mary as someone for whom we can resonate, someone with whom we can turn to and say, well, I can do what Mary did. I can at least show up at the tomb. I can stay at the tomb in my grief and confusion and weep and believe that Jesus will meet me in that place. And I think that's what we're invited to do. Jesus in verse 16 meets Mary and he says, Mary calls her by name. And she turns and says to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. Literally, it means my dear teacher. This is a moment of tenderness. It's a moment of intimate, restored relationship. Just like Nubigan was talking about, this is the fruit of the resurrection. There's so many other fruits we can and should celebrate. Jesus' victory and his triumph over sin and evil and the cosmic way in which that plays out in all time and all space forever and into eternity. But right here, right now, in the intimacy of our homes this intimate Easter, we need to remember that Jesus meets us in our confusion and he calls us by name. And in that way, Mary is for us a sign of great hope. What Jesus does to Mary, he wants to do for every single one of us. To call us by name and invite us into a taste, in a personal way, a taste of the resurrection, of the Easter hope, of the hope of the Spirit. This is Mary, I think, maybe now weeping in a profoundly different way. Weeping as she realizes the joy of knowing our Lord Jesus in his resurrection glory of knowing that we will, through his spirit for eternity, have this life with him, this restored relationship. This is the hope of Easter. Mary is so transformed by this relationship that she can't help but tell others about it. She leaves that place and goes and tells the others. We cannot miss the significance of this. Mary, a woman living in a patriarchal society, she is the apostle to the apostles. It is her testimony that is, is recounted here and recorded here. It is her testimony that brings hope to us here in this very moment, thousands of years later. Jesus so transforms her life that she brings transformation and hope to the apostles and to us here today. Thanks be to God. And I think for us then maybe the simple answer or the simple question is, do we have the ears to hear it? Do we have hearts that are open and able to receive and enter into this and stay with Mary at the tomb? I love John. I love Peter. This is not to demean them. John is the first to see. Peter's the rock upon which the church is built. And yet in this immediate moment, though the strength of their faith will come later, in this immediate moment, we're given the strength of, of Mary simply in her ability to wait and to be with Jesus until he shows up. And that's the hope of Easter. Easter is nothing if, it, if not an encounter of the resurrection, encounter of the living Lord Jesus. It's not something we rush into and rush past in a brash sort of way. It's not something that we keep at arm's length and just think about in a theological way. It is to be lived and encountered. And that encounter is not something you and I can manufacture. It's not something we can snap our fingers and make happen whenever we want it to. And so maybe this Easter, we simply sit at the empty tomb. With Mary, we sit and we wait and we say, Lord Jesus, would you come? Come, Lord Jesus, that ancient prayer of the church. Come and meet us in our confusion. Meet us in our longing because we want to encounter you. The hope that we need, the hope that the world so desperately needs is a lived experience of the living 
Lord Jesus. And so I'd simply say to you today, do you have the patience and the faith and the hope to sit at the tomb and wait until our Lord shows up? It may take time. Lent is a 40-day period of waiting. Easter is a 50-day season of feasting and of celebration. But don't simply rush into the feasting and begin to feast and celebrate and leave Jesus behind. Maybe that Easter feasting for us takes on this year a unique tone. And maybe you feast by refusing to leave Easter behind. Our world puts Easter on sale the day after Easter. And you can go buy all the the peeps and all the Reese's eggs and all the things and we want to just leave it behind and rush on to the next thing. But maybe the way we show faith and hope as the people of God this year is we refuse to leave it behind. We stay in this posture of waiting and anticipation at the empty tomb and say, come Lord Jesus, restore relationship wherever it's been broken and give us the hope of your resurrection. It's what we long for. It's what we need in every way. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as bold as it may sound, we simply say as your people this year, we refuse to leave the tomb until you show up. We stay in our places of doubt and confusion And yet we cling to hope and we believe the hope of Easter is not just something we think about. It's not just something that happened thousands of years ago, but it is hope for us right here today in this moment. And so fill our hearts with that hope. Help us to wait, believing and trusting that you come and you call us by name and you restore us to perfect relationship with you. Let's continue in prayer and pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Again, happy Easter. God bless you today and this Easter season in every way, you and those you love. May his blessing be on you. May the hope of the resurrection be deep within your heart and your soul this day and in the days to come. As we close now, we say what we say every single week when we finish our time together. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue our Easter celebration as we walk through this season as a family, the family of God. Tomorrow, join us for midday prayer and make sure you subscribe to our weekly reader that comes out on Wednesdays and Sundays, a fantastic way to stay connected to our life as a parish in these remarkable times. And so now as we close, we sing together one last Easter song.
It